this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over two billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today again I am connected via Skype with my wonderful brother in the United States of America, Tom Fress, from Inquisition Update to do the 13th reading of the wonderful book that Steve Wahlberg wrote in the beginning of the century, End Time Delusions. We are here to finish uh, with a few sentences the chapter we spoke about last time already and then we're probably going to go into the next chapter but as always uh, some new little thing has been dug up in the meantime and that's what we're going to read first we as i said that's me and my brother tom fress over there in the united states who i with a warm heart welcome to the broadcast today hello tom thank you hello yerk and nice to be with you i'm happy to be here and uh, anxious to get started with the reading Oh, absolutely and, uh, anxious, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My anxiousness starts as soon as this recording is done, brother. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like I just told you. Okay, let's not lose any time, Tom. Um, I just read to you a little part of the wonderful book from Ronald N. Cook, Antichrist Exposed, the Reformed and Puritan View of the Antichrist, Volume 1, because we made the point already a few times, you surely made the point a few times and earlier, and I then thought, well, that must be true, and we found proof in page 227 of this book from Ronald Cook, and now again we found proof on page 13 in the book, and that's the one that I just scanned before the broadcast here began. Uh, in the beginning of that book, uh, Ronald N. Cook speaks about Irenaeus, Hippolytus, and Tertullian. Now, who, for example, was Irenaeus? There are probably many people who do not know Irenaeus. But Irenaeus, as we can hear on Wikipedia, was a Greek bishop noted for his role in guiding and expanding Christian communities in what is now the south of France and, more widely, for the development of Christian theology by combating heresy and defining orthodoxy. Originating from Smyrna, now Izmir in Turkey, he had seen and heard the preaching of Polycarp, 
the last known living connection with the Apostles, who in turn was said to have heard John the Evangelist. Yeah? So we are speaking about a man who was born about 130 AD, as you see here, and who died about 200 or 202 AD. So one who was a Roman Catholic before the Roman Catholic Church even was founded. Let me explain it this way. Living in the second century, and he, according to Ronald Cook, wrote the following. Um, okay, I don't have another picture. I leave Tom on here. He's on, he's on directly anyway. Irenaeus, Hippolytus, and Tertullian. Irenaeus taught that Antichrist would come in the flesh, and he thought that he would be a Jew and arise from the tribe of Dan, a view which is still current today among some writers. <laughs> Who are those some writers? All futurist writers, all of the end time delusion writers, all of these left behind series as we spoke about these books last time. He sought to give the meaning of the number 603 score and 6, although he was far from dogmatic in doing so. He believed that Antichrist would rule for three and a half years, literal years that is, and rejected the idea that Antichrist was only to be found in apostates from the faith. He saw Antichrist, and this is the sentence you have to really understand, he saw Antichrist as a single evil person who would possess a kingdom. Now, if this isn't futurist teaching from the finest, even being a, the Antichrist being a quote-unquote Jew rising from the tribe of Dan, this is exactly as the quote-unquote Jesuits invented, isn't it, Tom? Yes, it is. This is, this is what the Jesuits literally dug up. Uh, they didn't invent futurism much to our dismay because I've spent so many years b believing and teaching that the Jesuits created futurism, that it was their, their brainchild. But the fact of the matter is the, those that the Roman Catholic Church considered to be the quote-unquote early church fathers are the authors of this futurist antichrist that laid the foundation for the belief in a, uh, a, a an antichrist that would rise uh, in the world just before Christ's return. And uh, this is quite different. Irenaeus is speaking quite differently than Paul was speaking. Paul was speaking about the imminent rise of the antichrist. He was speaking of a great falling away from the faith that would take place soon after his demise, soon after his death, there were people that were going to lead a great apostasy, okay? And that would cause the rise of this man of sin, the son of perdition. Now, Tertullian and these other so-called early church fathers came after Paul, and they obviously didn't understand, nor did they believe what Paul believed and taught. Paul believed and taught that that power that was now in control, that is the Roman Caesars, would be taken out of the way. And then that man of sin would be revealed. It was going to be a Roman power, according to Daniel's prophecy, the fourth and final beast upon the earth, would be a Roman power, and that it would uh, succeed the three previous kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece, and then finally Rome. And that power was already in power when Jesus walked the face of the earth. But it was going to be another Roman power that would replace the Caesars and this was what Paul was preaching to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 2. And it happened exactly the way Paul prophesied. Now, Tertullian and, and, and these early church fathers are teaching something different than what Paul taught. They're talking about a Jew, okay, and someone who uh, comes late in the, in the, in, in the future, and uh, they're speaking quite different than Paul. And don't you know that the Roman Catholic Church 
latched on to the teaching of these early church fathers and poo-pooed what Paul preached in order to find an excuse to exonerate themselves, that is, to exonerate the papacy from the onus of Antichrist. Look, if you're the Roman papal Antichrist, you're certainly not going to readily accept the idea that you're the man of sin, the son of perdition, the one whom Christ said he would come and destroy with the spirit of his mouth and, and, and the brightness of his coming. So you're going to latch on to whatever other alternative uh, uh, interpretation that you can find that puts the onus or the blame, the accusation of Antichrist on someone that is so distant in the future as to have exonerated the entire existence of the papacy from its first pope to its last. And that's what futurism does. And we find the roots of futurism in the first and second and third century Christians called by the Roman Catholic Church the early church fathers. And it's upon these apostates that the Roman Catholic Church places its foundation, a foundation quite different than the one that Paul laid for the church. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. I just want to make one little point because you just said that Jesus Christ will destroy the Antichrist with the spirit of his mouth and the uh, brightness of his coming, right? That's right. What is the spirit of his mouth? The Bible. Exactly. The so the destruction of Antichrist has already begun since That's the right. Reformers finally gave us Jesus' word, God's word, in our own language. So this is nothing that we are going to expect in the future to happen. This is happening right, right now. now. You are That's watching right. a video where this is in the making because we are exposing the Antichrist for what he is. We are destroying his theater, his lie, right. his deception all over the world. Right in Inquisition update in Hour of the Truth and other broadcasts, we are speaking with the spirit of his mouth to lay the foundation to destroy that Antichrist, and we are just waiting for the second part, the brightness right. of Jesus' coming. That leads right where we need to go, Yerk, and that is the spirit of his mouth. The spirit of his mouth exists in the prophecy of Daniel, where Daniel said, and he... Christ Jesus shall cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Okay? Now, that's not what they teach in our churches. That's not what the Roman Catholic Church has ever taught. It was, but it was Jesus who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. All right? When he gave up his own life on the cross, he satisfied the, 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 the righteousness of God. He made reconciliation between God and men. He brought in everlasting righteousness. We are forgiven. We've been restored to a right relationship with God in Christ's blood. And because it was his blood and his blood alone that redeems us and makes reconciliation for us, then from that point on, from his crucifixion, in the midst of the last 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy, that was his blood that was shed. It, it cancels out all other sacrifices. Okay, All the animal sacrifices were simply typifications of his one-time all-sufficient sacrifice. And when he gave up the ghost when his blood was shed there was an earthquake the rocks were rent and we were we were healed by his stripes we were healed jesus said it is finished and what does we mean by that daniel's prophecy is finished the 70th and final week or rather the 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 uh the confirmation of the covenant in christ's blood was made perfect visible for all the world to see. Okay? The sacrifices are finished, Tom. The sacrifices are finished. That's why the veil in the That's temple was the ripped from, from top to bottom. 
That's right. God ripped the veil of the temple. No more animal sacrifice. You can't continue to make animal sacrifices if the veil of the temple is ripped open. Okay? So all sacrifices and oblations have come to a screeching halt. To continue in animal sacrifices is simply to testify that you do not believe that Jesus was the Son of God that you do not believe that he was the propitiation of our sins. Well, speaking that of the you future... you do not believe that he recon reconciled us to God. Speaking of the future sacrifices and the probably to be built third temple in Jerusalem, that is, but we have a quote-unquote unbloody sacrifice within the Roman Catholic Church for centuries that is called the Mass, where they right. make it bloody through the hocus-pocus invention of transubstantiation, where they, with some hocus-pocus Latin words, hoc est corpus enum meum, demand Jesus Christ to descend from his throne in heaven into this little piece of wafer bread, and that wafer bread becomes the body, the blood, the spirit, the, um, the flesh, the humanity, and the... Um, Uh, divinity of Jesus Christ. That is right. transubstantiation. And then you, Roman Catholic, bow down before a Roman Catholic priest and he shoves that piece of Jesus cookie into your mouth and you eat it. That is cannibalism and that is accepting a sacrifice and that is, as Tom so wonderfully for years has said, Eating and drinking damnation to yourselves, eh, Tom? Right. That's exactly right. If if the if the Christian world, the professing Christian world, would have continued to believe the truth, and that is that Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease, there never would have been a Roman Catholic Church, because the foundational center. The, the spiritual center of the Roman Catholic Church, the center of every Roman Catholic Church service is the Mass. It's a sacrifice where the priest elevates the blood and the bread and says, hoc est in his corpus meus. This is the body of Christ. And then they crucify him again on the Roman Catholic Church, on the Roman Catholic altar. Anybody can read the Roman Catholic uh catechism and and learn what the roman catholic church teaches about the mass without the mass you have no roman catholic church it doesn't exist the central worship of the roman catholic church is this dogmatic belief that the priest changes the bread and the wine into the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ and then sacrifices him once again on the altar, the self-same sacrifice that Jesus offered on the cross. And then they eat it, partake of him, his blood and his body, as and, 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 and grace, thereby grace is infused. Okay? That's the literal salvation of a Roman Catholic is eating and drinking the blood and body of, of Jesus Christ. That is the central part of the Roman Catholic Church. That's the reason the priest exists to transubstantiate or change the substance of the bread and the wine into the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ to sacrifice him once again and forever every day on the Roman Catholic ch Church altar. Now, You cannot do that if you believe that Jesus, 2,000 years ago, caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And if you do participate in the Mass or any other kind of sacrifice for the redemption of man, for the remission of sins, you have committed a sin of all sins you have denied that Jesus paid the price. You've denied that his blood washed away your sins forever. And the Roman Catholic Church could have never come into fruition. But it was falling away from that belief, like Tertullian and like Hippolytus and like Irenaeus, the early church fathers, the great 
falling away that Paul prophesied about that would take place soon after his death, these early church fathers that are regarded even by Protestants today of being the great early church fathers, they were the falling away. They are the ones who led all of Christendom astray. And the very words that destroy the Roman Catholic Church without laying on any hands or weapons or shedding of any blood is simply in the belief what the Scripture says. Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease just exactly the way Daniel prophesied it to happen. And if the whole world in a day believes that truth, as the first century Christians did under Paul's ministry, the Roman Catholic Church crumbles, even its foundation crumbles, and there's not a shred of it remaining. That's how you destroy the man of sin, the son of perdition. It doesn't take but the two-edged sword, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, in the prophecy of Daniel, chapter 9, the Roman Catholic Church denies that Daniel was speaking of Jesus when Daniel said he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. So they put that on a phony antichrist and tack it on the end of time and thereby deceive the whole quote-unquote Christian world. And I believed that lie for 50 years of my life, and it was by the mercy of Almighty God that he opened my eyes one night at work reading Daniel's prophecy. The same can happen for you. Rome is destroyed in a word. Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And anybody who commits, makes a sacrifice today has done nothing but prove his unsaved status. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Now I suggest we go into today's reading of uh, the wonderful book Steve Wahlberg wrote in the beginning of this century, End Time Delusions. We are on the bottom of page 41 in the PDF as you read along. The seven-year tribulation theory is the title of this, sub uh, of this chapter. And we just have a few more sentences to go before it's done, and I'm going to give you a picture here of a book from Hal Lindsey that is probably known all over the quote-unquote Christian world in the United States of America. It is called The Late Great Planet Earth. It has already been in the beginning, sold more than 4,300,000 copies. And it is very interesting, as you see here on the top, it is from Zondervan Books. Zondervan is a publishing company that is owned by Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch, I think he is now deceased, or at least has given the job to his son, uh, is or was, no, it still is because those titles never are uh, taken away, uh, a knight of St. Gregory. That means he is a papal knight, he is an earth-spitting <laughs> pope lover, yeah? Uh, and he owns the Zondervan Company by what you get a lot and lot of books. Also, you get the King James Bible from there, but that is another subject to talk about uh, another time, not in this broadcast. Um, the late great planet Earth. Now, best-selling author Hal Lindsay in his The Late Great Planet Earth, as you can see in this picture, that book, reflects this current view when he writes about God's last seven years of dealing with the Jewish people for the long-awaited setting up of the kingdom of God, as we can read in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Now, speaking of a worldly kingdom, the Jews expected already 2,000 years ago, but Jesus clearly stated, My kingdom is not from hence. John 18, verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. According to Mr. Lindsay, 
during those seven years, quote, the Antichrist breaks his covenant with the Jewish people and causes the Jewish temple worship, according to the law of Moses, to cease, as written in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. We must conclude that the third temple will be rebuilt upon its ancient site in old Jerusalem, unquote. That is the deception by people like Hal Lindsey and Jenkins and all these others who were writing these other left-behind books that I showed you in the last broadcast. Therefore, according to countless modern interpreters, Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 is applied to a future Antichrist, a future peace treaty made with a <laughs> future state of Israel, for most of the time, now present, a future seven-year tribulation, and a future rebuilt Jewish temple inside Jerusalem. And all of this will supposedly start with the rapture. Honestly, that's a lot to interpret from that single verse, especially when Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 says absolutely nothing about any seven-year tribulation, about an antichrist or about a rebuilt Jewish temple. Could there be something wrong with this picture? You will find out in the next chapter. And while I'm going to the next chapter, Tom has probably to do another remark on the ending of this chapter we just read. Certainly I do. Uh, Hal Lindsey obviously was working for Rome. And Hal Lindsey painted a scenario that the Vatican wishes to fulfill in the world and is already at the time of the writing of, of uh, Hal Lindsey's book had already accomplished much of it. And that was the creation of the modern nation state of Israel. And what is most astonishing is before the modern nation state of Israel could be created, there had to be a need for it. Okay. And there had to be a political need for it. And what they achieved in this modern nation state of Israel came at the expense of what is believed to be 6 million Jews. The persecution of the Jews by Christians, no less. When Paul preached to us that we were not to persecute the Jews, we were not to boast against the branches, but we were to provoke the Jews to jealousy for their own Messiah, Jesus. Instead, the Christian world, by the leading of the Roman Catholic papacy, persecuted the Jews, persecuted relentlessly and pursued the Jews and murdered and killed them every chance they got. They used the First World War to do it. They used the Second World War to do it. And after those two world wars, the world was so weary of war that they were ready to settle for anything for peace. And that's how you got your modern nation state of Israel. And they absolutely need this modern nation state of Israel with Jews living in the land in order to justify the building of a Jewish temple, in order to justify the beginning of animal sacrifices to get the Jews to eat and drink damnation to themselves, having once again denied the Christ, the Lamb of God, who took away the sins of the world 2,000 years ago. Now you know what Rome's strategy is for the last Jewish question. It is their demise that Rome and the kings of the earth have created this modern nation state of Israel, not just their physical demise, but their spiritual demise. But God's got other plans for a remnant of the Jewish people. And my hope is that they come to understand the futurist deception of the Roman Catholic and the once Protestant churches now completely apostate that have brought all these futurist elements to pass in this world. Do you see what a great deception this is? 
do you see what ex- what length, what bloodshed, what lying wonder futurism is? The whole purpose is to lead the entire Christian world astray. No, the entire world, the- Tom. Not only the yeah. Christian world, but the entire world, because all the world accepts the nation state of Israel. Because they have no idea of real biblical teaching. And they accept that the Jews must be gathered again in their land where they lived 2,000 years ago. And Jesus Christ said, I will destroy this temple. I will not leave one stone left upon the other. And your house is being left to you desolate. The whole right. world is deceived. That's the problem. If it was only the Christians, all right. But it's the whole world. The whole world yeah. has has political um diplomatic uh, uh, relations with the nation state of Israel. The whole world accepts that state. Even communist China accepts it. Russia accepts it. Brazil accepts right. it. Australia accepts it. It's all over the world. This is, uh, it is, it is sometimes, sorry, it is sometimes so hard to grasp. This is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. There were only two people deceived. But those two people were constituting the whole populace of the world at that moment. Today, I'm afraid, more than 99% of the populace of this world are being betrayed by this political theater. And they don't want to see the truth because they don't have the truth because they don't read their Bibles. That's right. And only You're there right. is the I'm, truth to be found. I won't try to gainsay what you just said. You're right. The whole world is deceived. But the Bible speaks of the elect. If it were possible that even the very elect would be deceived. Now, how do you deceive the very elect? By deceiving the whole world. That's how the elect are deceived. By deceiving the whole world. But are we irretrievably deceived? Or do we still have time to change our minds, to open our hearts and our minds and our eyes to the truth, the spiritual, scriptural truth, that it was Jesus who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease, that God destroyed that temple. First he said, "I leave, your house is left unto you desolate, and then he sent the Roman 10th Legion to, to destroy it all the way to its foundation, not one stone remaining upon another. And now, this day and age, Christians are looking forward to a Jewish state and a Jewish priesthood and a Jewish temple to be rebuilt, to begin to make animal sacrifices again, thus proving once again that they reject Jesus? Is that what the Christian world is all about? No! The Scripture told us the truth. Jesus said, your house is left unto you desolate. Why was it your house instead of my house as a house of prayer? Because God left the building. God that's doesn't dwell in temples up. made with hands anymore. That's, that's right. God no longer dwells in temples made with hands. That, that refers to last week's broadcast. And he will never be seen in a man-made temple again. And if the Jews build their temple, if they begin animal sacrifices again, they will be a stench in the nostrils of an all-holy God. There's only one sacrifice that takes away sin. For the Jew and the Greek, that's Jesus, the one who caused all sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago when he said, It is finished. Salvation has been achieved for anybody who will come to me to think that the Christian world believes in a modern nation state of Israel for the purpose of creating a new priesthood, a new sacrificing priesthood, and a new temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and to commit abominations before the Lord in, in sacrificing animals which never took away the sin of the mankind, is deceiving the very elect. And it would never have happened had not futurism crept into the Protestant churches. Back to you, Yerk. 
Yeah, I'm just looking for this little picture of faith that tells us that salvation is never changed through the uh, through the testaments, nor with the old or the new testament. Salvation was, as you see in this picture, always achieved through faith. Yeah. The Israelites in the Old Testament took the lamb took the, the blood of lambs and goats and doves and bulls and everything to point to the blood that would be shed by Jesus Christ in the future. We, looking back to Jesus Christ being crucified 2,000 years ago, and we all are saved by the same faith. So, since Jesus Christ came, but the problem is that the Roman Catholic Church denies that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. And because she denies that Jesus Christ has came in the flesh, then of course you can point another time to these animal sacrifices or whatever and say, this is the only perpetuation that you need to go into heaven. In because the meantime, the Roman Catholic Church has used the Mass as their sacrifice. Anybody who does not believe in the blood of Jesus shed for us 2,000 years ago must make sacrifice. That's what the Roman Catholic Church does, and that's what the world is leading the Jews to do, to make sacrifices, to make reconciliation to God, and which is nothing but a rejection of the blood that Jesus came to this earth to bleed and die to redeem us. The whole world is deceived, led into deception by the Roman Catholic Church and the now apostate Protestant and Evangelical churches that don't even deserve the, the name Protestant and Evangelical. They're just Roman Catholics in Protestant clothing. Good point. Shall I continue in the book then, Tom? Yes. Chapter 5, called Dropping the Bomb, and let's see what kind of a bomb we will explode here. And let me tell you, this is not that kind of a bomb you hear about on the television. This is a mind bomb. This will explode in your head if you allow the scripture to enter your head and to understand it. Now, the author very often, I mean in every chapter, I think, uses an, uh, a quote from one or another quote-unquote famous person. In this case it was Mark Twain, who lived between 1835 and 1910, who uh, supposedly said, quote, a lie can travel halfway through the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. I think this is a quote quite known by people, but I think that when we are reading a book that is so important and that is so making the point that the Bible and the Bible alone is our sole pillar for authority and for faith, then we should start every chapter with a Bible quote. So I try to look up something that comes in the same spirit of what Mark Twain says here, something about the truth, and I was looking up a Bible quote, and I came up with Proverbs chapter 12, verse 19, where it says, The lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Prophecy well. thank you. <laughs> Prophecy minded Christians all over quote unquote planet Earth sometimes engage in a fierce debate about whether Jesus Christ will return for his church before the seven years of tribulation, the pre trip view, in the middle of the seven years, the mid trip view, or at the end of the seven years the post-trip view. And I just made this word planet green to say that I'm not agreeing with that, that the Earth is not a planet, I'm not discussing it, I'm just putting it in green so you know this is not the truth. Yet by far the most explosive question to few, too, too few, seem to be asking is, uh, again, yet by far the most explosive question too few seem to be asking is, quote, is an end-time seven-year period of tribulation really the correct interpretation of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 in the first place? Well, we spoke about that abundantly on the past broadcasts already. Now let's see what our author has to say about this. 
So, of course, Tom will make his comments again, but we spoke about this already abundantly in the first few, meaning 12 broadcasts, because this is the 13th. Now let's see what the author has to say about this. In 1945, after months of agonizing deliberation, and you know, uh, when it's green, it's not true, US President Harry Truman finally issued orders to drop two atomic bombs upon Japan in an attempt to end World War II. On August 6th, the quote-unquote little boy fell on Hiroshima. Three days later, the quote-unquote fat man was released over Nagasaki. Approximately 130,000 people were instantly vaporized. Many heated discussions have occurred as to whether or not it was the right thing to drop those bombs. One thing's for sure, in the minds of those who made that fearful decision, they believed it was for the ultimate good of America. <laughs> Again, green, not true. Why? Well, I'm going to play a little video here of Madeleine Albright. The deaths of 500,000, 500, sorry, 500,000 half a million Iraqi children was worth it for Iraq's non-existent weapons of mass destruction. Now let me just see that I find that video fast here on my computer. I think that I had uh, prepared that somewhere. Here it is. Um, I'm just not sharing the uh, uh, the voice, uh, the 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 volume with Tom. So for Tom, it will be uh, watching 23 seconds in silence. He doesn't hear what you are going to uh, uh, to hear right now. Let's play it. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when in, in Hiroshima. And and. You know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Yeah. So, there you hear it from the mouth of Madeleine Albright herself. The price of 500,000 dead Iraqi children was worth it. Was worth what? Well, the ultimate good of America. That's how they sell that to you, because they, he was supposed to have weapons of mass destruction that threatened America. Well, we should scrap the word America here and say the ultimate good of the papacy. They believed it was good for the ultimate good of the papacy. I would like to change the sentence to read like that. And I think Tom will agree with me here, don't you? Boy, absolutely. Uh, Viet or, uh, Japan was a military objective for the papacy. Uh, Viet or, or Japan, I keep wanting to say Vietnam. It's the same thing. Uh, the, sa the same things occurred. They kicked the Jesuits out. Uh, the Jesuits tried to Roman Catholicize Japan, but the emperor of Japan considered himself uh, divine and infallible. And the people worshipped the emperor of Jap Japan like he was God. And the papacy resented it because the papacy reserves divinity and, and infallibility to itself alone. And the United States, under false pretenses, bombed Japan back into the Stone Age in order to take that, that J Japanese emperor off of his divine and infallible throne and to put the pope on it. And the same thing happened for the Iraqis. Saddam Hussein kicked the Jesuits out of the country, wouldn't allow them to establish a central bank in Japan, or rather Iraq, and so the United States, the papal warrior, the papal crusader, launched a holy Roman crusade against Saddam Hussein and his regime to kick out those who kicked out the Jesuits in order to bring Iraq into this one Roman world. The papacy dis demands that God has established him as his vicar upon the earth, and that every man, woman, and child on the planet must worship the Pope and him alone. And that's why the Vietnam War took place. That's why the war against Japan took place. That's why the war against Iraq took place. And if you have any question about that, all you have to do is ask your own government, did Saddam Hussein have weapons of mass destruction? 
they will answer you unequivocally, no, he did not have weapons of mass destruction. You can ask him the second question, did Saddam Hussein have anything to do with 9-11? Their unequivocal answer will be, no, he had nothing to do with 9-11. They admit to this day, without equivocation, that none of the justification that Madam, Madam Albright or anyone else used to justify the Iraq war was a lie. And the American people still don't have the courage to do anything about it. Nor do they have the courage to defy this Vatican government in Washington, D.C. Back to you, Yerk. Dear friend, it is for the benefit of Christians everywhere that God's bump of truth should now be released over what I have come to call the 70th week of Daniel delusion. As we have already seen, Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 literally says, quote, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease. Now this may shock you, but historically the vast majority of well-respected Bible scholars have not applied Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 to a seven-year period of tribulation at all. Neither have they interpreted the he as referring to a future Mr. Deadly. Instead, they applied it to Jesus Christ. Notice... Did you hear that? Did you hear that? He says the same thing we've been saying. The he of Daniel 9 verse 27 is not a future antichrist it is Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago. Stephen Wolberg is absolutely correct in this assertion. And Stephen Wolberg, neither Stephen Wolberg or Tom Fress gets any credit for it. Because true Bible-believing Christians throughout the century have always believed this that it was Jesus who confirmed a covenant with many for one week of years, seven years. And in the mid, that, that's, the sev that's the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. One week of years, seven years. Remember, there were seven weeks and 62 weeks. That's 69 weeks. And then there was one week. It followed immediately after the 69th week. It's called the 70th week of Daniel. And in the midst of that 70th and final week, in the midst of that week of years, after three and a half years after his baptism, Jesus, he, Jesus, Messiah the Prince, caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. It, that's what he did to confirm the covenant in his blood. He shed his blood on the cross three and a half years after his baptism in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. Prophecies fulfilled 2,000 years ago. There's no future seven-year period of time. Describe any way you want. There's no future seven years of time being referred to anywhere in Daniel's prophecy. There's not one word in Daniel's prophecy that talks about an antichrist. It's all about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Prince, and the Prince that shall come are speaking of none other than Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ who came in, at the beginning of the 70th and final week. It's Jesus Christ who confirmed the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, he gave up his own life Became, becoming the sacrifice that redeemed mankind to God and put an end to all sacrifices forever. Now, that doesn't fit with Rome's agenda. Reminding you that the papacy is the man of sin, the son of perdition, that all Bible-believing Christians throughout the centuries have believed that that power that replaces the Caesars which is inarguably, no one contests the fact that it is the papacy that replaced the Caesars. 
listen, I want to tell you one more time in the clearest language that I can fashion. Nobody argues that it's not the papacy that replaced the Caesars. That is not in dispute. It's like falling off a log. You can't help but get it right. The papacy is the man of sin. And he is the one who says, no, the sacrifices have not ceased. And they serve the mass every day. The man of sin, the son of perdition in Rome, by serving the mass, rejects the blood and the covenant of Jesus Christ, saying he did not come in the flesh. That is the spirit of Antichrist. That's the spirit of the papacy. And it's also the spirit of futurism that says Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh because the 70th week of Daniel did not fulfill, was not fulfilled 2,000 years ago, but it's a seven-year period of time tacked on the very end of time just before Christ returns. But don't you know, even they can't get their cards straight because they talk about a pre-tribulation rapture, a mid-tribulation rapture, and a post-tribulation rapture. Which one is it? They're liars. And they've deceived the very elect with their futurist lie. Now it's time for the elect to tell the truth It was Jesus who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Anyone in this world who has made a sacrifice after Jesus was crucified on that cross in the midst of the 70th and final week of Daniel eats and drinks damnation to himself. He eats and drinks the spirit of Antichrist. That is a sacrificing Roman Catholic and a sacrificing Jew. God's people have received their sacrifice. They make no more sacrifices. They only remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us 2,000 years ago. And they condemn anybody who would make a sacrifice and, and make Christ's work of no effect on the cross. Do you see that even the very elect of God are deceived by futurism? You can't hardly find a church in this country that doesn't preach futurism. That's how the very elect are deceived. How long will we remain deceived when the truth is so palpably evident? Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Wonderful explanation you gave there. Now, let's continue in the book. Notice what the world-famous Bible commentary written by Matthew Henry that you find in Esort, if you want to, says about Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Quote, By offering himself a sacrifice once and for all, he, Jesus, shall put an end to all the Levitical sacrifices. Unquote. Thus, Matthew Henry applied Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 to Christ not Antichrist. Another famous commentary written by British Methodist Adam Clark says that during Daniel 9 verse 27 term of seven years, Jesus himself would confirm or ratify the new covenant with mankind. Another dusty Bible commentary reveals he shall confirm the covenant, Christ. The confirmation of the covenant is assigned to him. No mention whatsoever of the Antichrist. Matthew Henry, if he were standing here before us today, would tell us that nowhere in Daniel's prophecy is any Antichrist referred to directly or indirectly. It's all about Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come, Christ Jesus who in the midst of the week, the 70th and final seven-year period of time of Daniel's prophecy, would confirm the covenant in his blood, would confirm it by shedding his own blood, and put a permanent end to sacrifices once and for all. Therefore, 
The Roman Catholic Church is not a church of Jesus Christ. It is the anti-church, the counterfeit church, and you have the proof. It's Daniel's prophecy. Any Jew who would build a temple and an altar and sacrifice a lamb or any other animal has denied the Christ that bought them 2,000 years ago. It's just that simple. Back to you, Yerk. Here's one more statement from a book called Christ and Antichrist, published in 1846 by the Presbyterian Board of Publication in Philadelphia. Looking upon this book here, this is why I looked it up in the internet. On page 2, under recommendations, are endorsements from many Presbyterian, Methodist and Baptist ministers, including an official representative of the Southern Baptist Convention. Commenting on the final week of Daniel 9, 27, that ancient volume states, and this is, by the way, not on page 2, I looked it up, it's on page 23 in the PDF that you can download, and the link will be provided in the description box of this video, under section 40, uh, 41, and that is on the fourth line, to be found, this quote. Sometime during the remaining seven the Messiah, he, the Messiah, was to die as a sacrifice for sin and thus bring in everlasting righteousness. Here are allusions to, ev uh, to events so palpable that one, <coughs> that one would think the people among whom they occurred could not possibly have misapplied the prophecy. Unquote. So you can read this in the book Christ and Antichrist, or Jesus of Nazareth, proved to be the Messiah, and the papacy proved to be the Antichrist, predicted in the Holy Scriptures, by Reverend Samuel J. Castles. A book that is, as I said, free to get on the internet, and the link that is here on adventsbelief.com will be provided for you in the description box of this video. Okay, here we go. The following ten points provide logical and convincing evidence that Daniel's famous 70th week has no application to any future seven-year tribulation at all. Rather, this great prophetic period was definitely fulfilled nearly 2,000 years ago. I'm quite sure, because we only have about ten minutes left to fulfill the hour, that we will not go through all ten points, especially not with Tom, of course, uh, bringing interesting comments in the meantime. But let's see how far we go. Ten points are stated here. Point number one. The entire prophecy of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, covers a period of 70 weeks. Logic requires... <laughs> now let me make a comment for a second... Logic is something that many people who went through modern education miss. They cannot logically think anymore, especially when it comes to books like the Bible. They maybe have logic when they think of mathematics, arithmetics, but logic in this world, measuring events in this world against a God-given conscience, that logic very often is very far to seek for. Logic requires that 70 weeks refers to one consecutive block of time. In other words, to 70 straight sequential weeks. The truth is, there is no, not one example in scripture or anywhere else of a stated time period starting stopping, and then starting again. I highlighted this blue not only because this is true, but because this is a sentence you should memorize. The truth is there is no example in scripture or anywhere else of a stated time period starting, stopping, and then starting again. All biblical references to time are consecutive. 40 days and 40 nights in Genesis chapter 7 verse 4. 
400 years in Egypt, see Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. 70 years of Babylonian captivity, see Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, etc. In Daniel's prophecy, the 70 weeks were to begin during the reign of Persia and continue to the time of the Messiah. Tom, any remarks on what I just read? No. No, I don't have any remarks that I haven't already made. No, that's right, that but, you haven't already I'll made. <laughs> no, we're, we're, using, we're using logic here. There's, there's no interruption in the time period. Hmm. Daniel prophesied a 70-week period of time. That's 490 years. 70 times 7 is 490. There were, he broke that 70-week period into three subgroup periods. A 49-year period of time, or seven weeks of years. A 484-year uh, period of time, called 62 weeks, altogether making 69 weeks, which leaves only one week left. Okay. And that, the New Testament, is actually the infallible historical record of that seven-year period of time. That is our testament, our record of history of the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. The New Testament is literally the historical record of the complete and perfect fulfillment by Messiah the Prince of that 70th and final week. It was a prophecy to Daniel's people, the Jews, and to Jerusalem. And when that 70th week was over, which concluded at the stoning of Stephen, the gospel went to the Gentiles. Jerusalem, the gospel left Jerusalem, if you will, and all of a sudden the apostles, the disciples, were allowed to go to witness to the Gentiles. The, in that case, from that point on, the gospel has been in the hands of the Gentiles ever since. The Jews don't believe in Jesus. They can't preach the gospel because they don't believe the gospel. It has been our responsibility for the last 2,000 years. When they stoned Stephen, they said, you count yourselves unworthy of salvation, so we go to the Gentiles. That's when it was free for the apostles to go to the Gentiles and preach the gospel. Do the Gentiles preach the gospel today? Absolutely. The 70th week of Daniel is over. It has been over for 2,000 years. There's no future re redoing of the 70th week. It's all a lie, and that lie comes straight from the Roman Catholic Church who says that Jesus must be sacrificed over and over and over and over again, as if his one-time all-sufficient sacrifice on the cross of Calvary was of none effect. That's what the Roman Catholic Church's purpose is, to render the gospel of Jesus Christ and his blood to no effect. And this author is telling us the truth. And so did Matthew Henry. And so did all Bible-believing Christians throughout history, the ones that Rome has destroyed, the ones that are the subject of Fox's Book of Martyrs. All the martyrs of Jesus throughout the centuries are those who claimed, number one, that Jesus is the Christ, and that, number two, the papacy is the Antichrist. And it's those people who are still the targets of Rome, those who will never bend the knee to the man of sin in Rome. That's why Jap Japan had to be destroyed. That's why Vietnam had to be destroyed. That's why Iraq had to be destroyed. That's why Nazi Germany wreaked so much havoc in Europe. And Germany was destroyed, by the way. That's right. The, the German Protestant spirit was completely and utterly destroyed. A part, right. a part in Western Germany where I grew up through ecumenism and the other part in Eastern Germany that doesn't exist since 30 years now anymore, 
by communism. Who be, people Listen, became atheistic. Atheistic. It was only, it was only Bible reading, Bible believing Christians who had the real, true Word of God in their hands that could read it and understand it by the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit, could tell the world, we don't need a modern nation state of Israel. We are not to persecute the Jews. We are to provoke them to jealousy for their own Messiah. There never would have been a second world war. There never would have been a first world war. Rome had to have the first and second world war to silence the Protestant voice. The First and Second World War was against Protestantism. It was against the Bible. The object of Rome was to, de to destroy the dissenters, was to destroy the protesters. It was only the Protestant voice that could have awakened the world out of their futurist delusion. And so they were silenced. Now what do we have left in the world? Nothing but futurists. That's what the world wars accomplished. Silencing the Protestant voice. Silencing the historicist voice. And creating a modern nation state of Israel. Not for the Jewish salvation, but their, for their final destruction. And to deny that Jesus even came in the flesh. So that because if you, believe, if you believe the 70th week of Daniel was not yet accomplished in Jesus, then Jesus wasn't the Messiah. Let's go let, ahead, Yer. Yeah, let's go back to Daniel chapter 9, Tom. First of all, I uh, highlighted the word requires because I would even change it to the word dictates. Logic dictates that 70 weeks refers to one consecutive block of time. But let us speak about one other thing. We always speak about Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, because they are, of course, so important. I don't take anything away of that. But do you remember a few years ago, Tom, we had an evening of two broadcasts? And the first broadcast was a reading of Daniel chapter 9, but we started in verse 1. And the beginning mm -hmm. of Daniel chapter 9 is a prayer. Daniel is on his knees. Daniel is praying to God for forgiveness of his people's sins and of his own sins. And he is praying that God would allow the Jews to survive the Babylonian captivity because he says something like in, in this regard, if we, the Jews, are not in the world anymore, who else do you, God, have to speak for you? That mm -hmm. prayer that Daniel spoke was heard in heaven and immediately the archangel Gabriel was sent to comfort him with the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 through 27 to tell him God has not forsaken his people. He will rebuild their city. They can rebuild the temple. They can go in the temple and worship God as God demands to be worshipped. And then the Messiah will come and make a covenant with many, with those many who accept him. The first, right, part, the first part of Daniel chapter 9 is, quote unquote, a little bit forgotten. The author goes here into Daniel chapter 9 verse 2 where he says, speaks of the 70 year captivity. Yeah, it speaks of the 70 year captivity. Daniel is in sackcloth and ashes about the punishment God is giving to his people. And he says, God, please allow us to be a witness for you in the world. And God hears his prayer. And I think, Tom, for you to explain this a little bit more would be a nice ending of this broadcast today. Yes, Daniel was on his knees praying and confessing his own sins and the sins of his people, Israel. And if you'll read Daniel's prayer of confession, it's gut-wrenching. And it's even all the more gut-wrenching when you realize that Protestants could pray that same prayer. That we've sinned in believing in futurism as because our sin 
And because our punishment by the Romans for believing and teaching historicism, that we've been reduced to futurist slaves of Rome. Well, I wish to repent of that sin. I wish to confess my sin and the sin of my Protestant people so that there would remain a witness for the true Christ in this world today. Because without us, there is no witness for Christ. Do you think Roman Catholicism could be a witness for Christ? Do you think any other religious group in the world could be a true witness for Christ? It's only historicist Christians can be a witness in this world for Jesus, Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come of Daniel's prophecy. And until God restores us, till God sends, sends an angel to reveal to us our error, our futurist error, we'll remain in our futurist delusion and we won't be able to witness, witness to anything but our own spiritual demise. But I have greater hopes that Christ won't allow this world to be devoid of a true, faithful witness to his testimony. And God's going to call out a remnant of the futurists and restore them to the historicist truth that Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled in history 2,000 years ago, as a matter of fact. And the New Testament is our infallible written record of that history of the 70th and final week and the sacrifice that caused all sacrifices to cease. And thereby, with that belief, we have destroyed all of Christ's opposition. By recognizing Jerusalem and moving our embassy there, uh, our country is saying what we know from history and the Bible, that Jerusalem has actually been the capital of Jerusalem for 3,000, or uh, capital Israel. of Israel for 3,000 years. And here's why that is so significant. That historical truth that Jerusalem has been the capital for 3,000 years absolutely explodes the myth that comes from the left that somehow the Jewish people just came into that land 70 years ago and they took it away from the Palestinians and that the Jews have no rightful claim to it. The Bible says and history confirms that God gave that land to the Jewish people and I believe as Genesis 12 says God blesses those countries that bless Israel and he curses those countries countries that curse Israel. I believe President Trump and the United States are not only on the right side of history in this decision, they're on the right side of God. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. If you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this, and then you say, how did this miracle happen? It was the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them, he has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers, that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. You come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And um, it's a miracle that it took place.